Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, a humble human on a mission here to help you both look and feel your best. Now in today's episode, we have a very special guest here. We have my dear uncle, Robert Rogers, joining us today, and he's recently written a book and it's called Shabazz Rising. And why I'm really excited to share my uncle, his story, and this book with you all is because you've heard me talk about how I like to kind of bring things into communication and navigating life and the way that I look at actually really the strategies of how we can both look and feel our best. And there's some intelligence that goes into that. There's some situational awareness to keep you safe and environmental toxins. So... Bob Rogers, Bob's your uncle, Robert Rogers is a notable published historian and comes from a very rich background. And so I'd love for you to share with everybody your background, and then we're going to get into some of your history and really some of the skills that you as a leader have and really the importance of this book. And I love to read espionage novels, um, but this book is actually even specifically for those in the military. But I like espionage novels because it teaches me about tradecraft. So I'd love to also focus on situational awareness and tradecraft so that we can go through life with a greater sense of security and ease and be aware of different threats and how to resolve conflict and strategy. I mean, you basically wrote the just to, to preface my dear uncle here, the war strategy for Canada during the Cold War. And so he's a he's an expert in the world of intelligence and world events and things like that. So give everybody a bit of an introduction of who you are, what you're all about, what some of your values are, and why this book is such an important piece in your life's purpose. Well, I don't I don't think anybody can be an expert in, in almost anything. Um, I have, I have worked in intelligence. I have spent 33 years in the Navy, uh, both at sea as a ship driver and also in the intelligence world. And it, um, I, I don't consider myself an expert. Uh, the book is written uh, mainly because of, of uh, some things that, took place during my career that um, I thought should be brought to the attention of, of authorities. Um, I'm, I'm an elderly um, uh, author, if you will. Uh, I have been around for a long time and, uh, and I'm not sure I have too many books in me, uh, but this particular one um, I enjoyed writing and I enjoyed um uh, talking about it. Uh, and your previous book was actually, a, it was it was a very important historical piece talking about family history and coming over from Europe to Canada and what that was all about. So there was there was a yeah. lot of history in that. Now this book is is quite a bit of strategy. Yes. Now why is having strategy and situational awareness in life actually a key asset? There's a lot of things going on in the world right now that um, uh, it is difficult for most people to put all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that's what I've tried to do in this book is to put some of those pieces together so that people understand. Um, the first book I wrote uh, was a historic novel and it described my family uh, arriving in North America. Uh, about 1728, and um, how the French and Indian War and subsequently the American Revolution impacted the family and how they ended up in Canada as part of the United Empire Loyalist Movement. Um, this one is totally different. It's, it's as if I decided, uh, got up one morning and decided that I was going to change <laughs> what I was doing because I could have continued on with historical books and and so on, but uh, but I did. I decided to to write something totally different. Um, this uh, there was a situation that happened early in my military career, where I 
the, the USS Vincennes, if for those of you that are aware of military history, uh, the USS Vincennes in about 1988 uh, during the Iran-Iraq war uh, was responsible for shooting down a, an Iranian Airbus filled with passengers. And um, it, it caused a number of issues in, in the world of intelligence. Um, but other than those that were involved in the Middle East conflict at the time, the rest of us in North America sort of said, oh, well, that's too bad. We're, we're sorry for the passengers and so on. Much like the more recent one when the, uh, when the Iranians shot down a, uh, another airline that, was, that had Canadian passengers on board. The, the incident happens and then it fades from memory and it goes away. What I tried to do in this book is say, okay, there was an incident and now these are the follow-on events that happened from that incident. Um, in the Vincennes book, uh, Vincennes case as an example, it, um, it took place in 88, long before the storyline of this book starts. But um, on board that aircraft were the parents of the heroine or villain, as you, depending on, <laughs> on which, what you want to look at her um, for. Uh, what uh, what happened to her, um, her parents were on that flight. And so I used that as an example and, uh, and then developed the story from there. Um, when the incident happened, I was a very junior intelligence officer in MARPAC headquarters in Esquimalt. And um, I saw the, the incident as... Um, looking at it from a retaliatory perspective, whether the Iranian forces were, were going to, uh, to retaliate against um, the U.S. particularly and, and the Allies for that point, because uh, Canada was part of the Allied forces with them, um, whether that was uh, going to impact the way we were collecting intelligence on the West Coast. So you kind of, you saw things maybe a little bit differently than some of your colleagues. Yes. They, they saw it as an isolated incident that took place in Iran and wouldn't have any complications. So what was it? You, like your spidey senses or kind of seeing the writings I, on the wall? I, I guess it was just, um, just an analysis and, and looking at the, the potential for terrorist activity that took place outside of, uh, of the areas where terrorist activities were taking place at that point in time. What was it like to see things differently than your peers, which you ended up being correct and potentially some things could have been avoided? What was that like? Well, you, you, uh, you don't always agree with your boss. And... Uh, there are some, sometimes you have to stand your ground and, and say, no, I really am concerned about this. And that's what happened in this case. I saw that um, the activities um, of the terrorists could possibly, um, as a result of the Vincennes incident, be exported from the Middle East. And like there could be something actually yes. bigger happening, yeah. which and we then saw with 9-11. Yes, and that's that's exactly what I saw when I was writing this. I, at the time, in 1988, I didn't see 9-11 over the, over the horizon, but I saw the potential for terrorism to be exported from the Middle East. And I remember back in 1988, we were, we were dealing with uh, with terrorism as, as being somebody with a car bomb or somebody um, with, a, with an explosive vest on them that would blow up. And terrorism was not exported. It was a local activity. Uh, when after 9-11, all of a sudden, terrorism became a worldwide threat. And so, so for people who, who think about terrorism from that perspective, um, the world changed with 9-11. Now, it, it changed because terrorism came home to America, but it also changed because it was an exporting of terrorism outside of, of the things. Now, there was the Olympics um, where, where terrorists attacked the, uh, 
the uh, Israeli athletes that took place before 88. But um, very seldom did that did that happen. And we started to hear about it more and more because then if all of a sudden of it's course. on the media. Yes, it's media on the news. Exported but, it. but it's so hard, to, like for you with your perspective, you see the intelligence and it's like what we see on the news is way after the fact, mm -hmm. which is why your book is so interesting because you're talking about the sequence of events and then you have a prediction at the end of it. Well, I, I do, but uh, my prediction may not be what other people will, will see. Um, Certainly, the, um, the the whole concept of uh, international trade uh, doesn't stop because there's a war someplace. Um, international trade is continuing on in spite of what's going on in the Middle East right now. We have ships that are running through the Suez Canal and through Panama and 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 so on. That, and some uh, are exporting goods yeah. in a mutually beneficial way. But you know, then there's new technology that's yes. come out to track ships, just like how we are tracked in a way too. I, I would love to hear from you, what can we do when we're hearing of all these calamities and, you know, war is on the horizon, this, that, you know, I don't even want to say those words, mm -hmm. but what can we do as people to stay in peace and continue to rely on faith to stay positive and focus well, on really yeah. the life that's with ourselves and our families? Faith is very important uh, these days in particular, because uh, without, without faith, um, everything is negative. Uh, you have to have some faith in order to, to bring um, some kind of sense of, of realism to what's going on, knowing that you have another place to go rather than the world ending tomorrow. Or to make an impact. Or to make an impact. And show love and be of service yeah. and enjoy the, the yeah. bounty of living and beauty. Uh, sometimes it's pretty hard to be loving and caring and, and, and love your enemy when your enemy is carrying machetes and, and, uh, and uh, bomb vests and so on. Well, but, you don't have to show kindness to people who are a threat. I mean, that's not what I'm saying, no, but I it's, know. it's yeah. the people in our direct lives. Yeah. 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 What would you say has been a beneficial, first of all, before I ask this next question, uh, I was very honored that you invited me to do the audible for your book. Um, before my next question, why do you want my voice to be the voice of the book? That's a question I hadn't um, I hadn't really thought of. Uh, you know, you I think you have a, a an angelic voice, if you will, um, and um, and would do very well in narrating uh, narrating the book as I intended it. So um, so I guess that's the reason. It you you were you were number one in a very short list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still very honored. I was really hoping you would ask me to. And when you did, mm -hmm. I was um, very honored. You suggested it first. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, there's, there's some names in our family and references in our family that are loosely uh, utilized in the book as, as forms of inspiration. But for, for everyone tuning in here, I'm curious what aspects of me made it into the book? To kind no, of like inspire You're different. going to have to interpret that for yourself. Well, I've, I've picked up on what those are. Uh, but uh, for those of you tuning into the show, there are little little sprinkles of inspiration from yeah. various members of our family. Various animals, members of the family. Which I, I, which I think to, is fun. I wanted to make it um, make it fun as well. I mean, it's... Uh, it's enter very entertaining. Yeah, for, for people that, um, that know nothing about my family and, and about our relations, uh, they won't get the inside jokes that are that are bantered around, but I wanted to make it interesting for family members as well, which is why I wrote some of them into the book. Um, the, uh, the main character, uh, who's the intelligence officer in the book, um, mirrors some of my career, but not all of it. And, um, and he, had, he spent more time in the intelligence world than I did. Um, but I had to do that in order to make, make all the characters meld together properly. Um, his uh, eldest daughter becomes the, 
the executive officer of one of our Canadian frigates. And, um, and that was important. I had to write some of that in there. So some of the characters don't um, meld exactly to my own family, but they're there. And some of the, the expectations I had for their, for their future are mirrored in, in the book. And then there's a few jokes as well, such as your father and, and, <laughs> and your mother in there. There's some things that are called tradecraft. Mm -hmm. And for everybody tuning in, like I love reading espionage novels for the pure enjoyment of it all. It's like a life I could never live that I know you lived. And there's some skills and tactics in there. Now, I'm curious what kind of like tr from a, a female perspective, learning about tradecraft for everyday life and safety and situational awareness, how important is that? Well, I think it's, it's very important for people to be aware of their surroundings and aware of, of their friends and who their friends are and the opinions that their friends hold. Um, in the United States right now, they're, they, they are so uh, diametrically opposed to each other in the Democrats and the Republicans that um, it, no matter who wins the election, they're on the verge of a civil war. And uh, they haven't been in that position for a long time. Uh, we're getting the same type of situation developing in Canada, the Liberals and the Conservatives are so far apart in the polls. But it's, it's the division that pulls it's us apart. It's the division, that, yeah, that, that's pulled the whole thing apart. And um, I don't think we're on the verge of a civil war here in Canada, but I think we need to be aware of what's going on south of the border. And, and we have to be uh, aware that, that there's a lot of falsehoods that are coming out of the press. Uh, not everything is the truth. And you can't always rely on, on what you're hearing. Can we just repeat this? <laughs> not everything. You and I have argued about this point before. Yeah. Well, not argue, but, you know, have an open yeah. discussion. And I mean, that's really important. And even from a health perspective, it's like, what's true? What's not true? You have to use your own discernment. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to novel times like these mm -hmm. days, you know, there's always this new biohacking health gadget. There's always this new diet. There's always this new event in the news. When all these novel things start happening, and especially in the couple of years, it's like a new thing after a new thing after a new thing, a new threat, new conflict, one after another. Like how much can our consciousness, our hearts and our minds handle? Like how do we balance having an awareness of our surroundings and world events and still maintaining our grounded personal and professional lives? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I have not uh, thought a great deal of it from that perspective because of course my, my training has, um, has required me to be aware all the time. You know, I, I go into a restaurant, I find a, I find a booth at the back where I can watch the door. I mean, th these are just things that I automatically do. So you're sitting with your back against the wall, yeah. your lov lovely wife is facing you so that you have an awareness of yeah. the room. Yeah. And particularly if the TV's over there. So I can use the TV. <laughs> but, but no, because uh, you know, you can take that to extreme and you can get too serious about it. And, and um, y you have to, you have to find a way to balance all of that. And as a woman, Honestly, there's so many differences between men and women, the masculine and feminine dynamic, the male being the protector, the provider, the woman, you know, really supporting the health and the peace of the home. Yes, but she also wants to take over. Well, depending on the woman, right? <laughs> it, it's not a takeover because then that's the issue with that, which we're seeing in relationships mm -hmm. these days is the corporate woman mm -hmm. and wearing the pants because the man isn't. So it's it's really getting back to those basics of teamwork 
and support and looking at how we can support one another. So I'm a fan of, you know, when I'm around people and they have that situational awareness, they could be violent if they needed to. Mm -hmm. I'm able to more relax into my feminine mm -hmm. and really enjoy myself knowing I don't have to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's different and noticed more in different cultures because I've done a ton of traveling and seen the differences between men and women in different cultures. But my question was, how do we balance? Like say, for example, you were to come up with a time frame in a day, like how much would be, do you think healthy and allow us to get a grasp of what's going on? Like how much time during a day watching the news or reading this or reading that is healthy? Well, I spend probably a, a quarter of my my day reading um uh newscasts and and uh, and bullets and so on that i that i get i'm no longer in intelligence and so i miss that i miss the the fact of of knowing what's really going on rather than listening to to the uh, the press all the time as we were coming down here to victoria we we lost most of our satellite radio and we started listening to Fox news. Boy, am I not going to do that anymore? <laughs> <laughs> it's like listening to the CBC with, with no controls on, but um, no, no, what's the problem here? What's the problem with those, those outlets? Like where are they getting their funding from? They're, they're, they're well, the funding is, is uh, for large uh, portion is, um, is actually from, the people that they're supporting and therefore their their attitudes are very one-sided you see that with the cbc um all the money is coming from the government therefore the government's right and nobody nobody can can contradict them and here i thought it was a conspiracy theorist <laughs> well that's later <laughs> no it's um uh that's that's my take on that and of course fox news um has a history of that of always being on the side of the of the Democrats. And in the nineties they had to relay what side they were a part of. But yeah. then after, you know, we saw Oprah and Maury Povich and all these reality shows, mm -hmm. they no longer had to disclose that, which I think was a bit of a disservice for people to then form balanced decisions and views on what's going on. Um, so I'm sure we could have a whole other topic mm -hmm. and, and session on like where to get great sources from. I would say one of my best reads for looking at where I get information from, especially from the health side of things to mm -hmm. be my most radiant version is actually eye contact. Mm -hmm. If people have an inability to have very clear, concise, coherent eye contact, or their eyes are darting everywhere, and they have this light, they have this sparkle, they have radiance. Mm -hmm. Radiance is in accordance with Ayurveda, the 10th body. We have our body, mind, spirit, energy, first four, and then the 10th body is the electromagnetic projection of what's going into the world. And also seeing that there's a balance. There's a balanced perspective, not just one-sided, because mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be grounded. Like for you in intelligence, you have to see the whole picture and then put things into place, consider what are the driving forces here? What's the potential outcomes? How can we prepare ourselves for re potentially resolving a conflict? What can be done? I'm really curious with your background in intelligence, the degree, the amount of emphasis on communication and asking the right questions. I know you and I both have read um, Chris Voss's work mm -hmm. on Never Split the Difference. I really like that book. And I've done some exchanges with you just mm -hmm. kind of for fun um, at the family dinner table. How important is learning how to communicate and ask the right questions and read people in everyday life? I don't know how to answer that question. It, um, again, most of, of what I do um, has been the result of my training. So a lot of things are automatic. Totally. And, and I don't, um, I haven't actually sat down and thought about, gee. Well, what, what was it like, say, for example, your daughter when she started dating? How did you size up the guys? Well, I didn't uh, have a lot to, to do with that. I mean, it was her choice. Um, but um, I think most of her friends um, uh, considered that uh, I was Rambo 
and that I had a shotgun at home when, <laughs> if they didn't bring her home on time. Right. I would be there on the on the stairs uh, at the at the house waiting for them to come home, and um, and she didn't bring very many boyfriends home. So I don't know whether she spread that rumor or or uh, it was it was picked up by the guys. I don't know, but. Uh, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time worrying about Pam. Very good. I, you know, I think it's great when we're teaching our children how to form friendships and form relationships, like what to look for, and also when we're in relationships, how to convey what our needs are with clear communication and having the empathy to see someone else's perspective, which you have to do in the intelligence world in able, in order to predict what their next move might be, mm -hmm. right? Every great chess player, every master, they're thinking like 10, 12 moves ahead. Mm -hmm. And more amateur chess players are like one to three kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these things that you use in your life are, are on autopilot now. That's why I'm hearing this, this repeat of, I don't know how to answer that question, mm -hmm. but I know it's there. So that's why I'm kind of digging mm -hmm. to, to get a little bit further. So let's go back to tradecraft for a moment okay. of what's typically an espionage novel. Some of my favorite authors are uh, Daniel Silva, for example, mm -hmm. or Jason Matthews. I've really loved their works because I learned so much. I learned, I told you just the other day, I had someone follow me through, mm -hmm. through a number of turns and actually had to call the police and mm -hmm. they provided that, you know, patrol and protection so that I felt more at ease. Mm -hmm. How important do you think do you feel like things could be prevented if more women had a situational awareness of, you know, who are the characters around them? Is someone following them? And what are some of the things they could do for safety? Do you, do you think that things could be avoided for the protection of women? No, I, I really don't think about it. You know, I, I, I should be thinking about it because I'm an older guy now. Um, but um, I'm not worried about being stopped at a at a street stop somewhere and somebody hide, uh, carjacking my car and, and so on. I, I just, I just don't worry about that thing. I, I ignore it from, um, from my situational awareness, if you will. The, um, I try to, uh, rely on my training and, and so on to, I, th I think it's just running in the background because yeah. I can guarantee you if, if something was a little bit off, you, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. I think it's really just in the background. And that's actually probably why I think yeah, your wife, matter. yeah, has felt so safe around you as well. Like you've had kids, they've all had kids, mm -hmm. things like that, you know, which is great. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an asset for the male to have these qualities for the protection and the leadership of the family. And you've done some other really beautiful things after your work in the military, you then went on to be an administrator at a church. You were a leader for a scouts and hockey league and things like that. What was that like for you going from, you know, writing a war plan to a country and overseeing a battleship to then being a leader and administrator in the other aspects? Like, what did you get from that? What did you, what were you able to take from your leadership and intelligence and do other things that were in service of, of kids and also at church. Well, the only battleship that I saw was was one that was firing guns, but he was firing guns away from us. Uh, you, you have to actually be at sea and understand that when these 16 or 18 inch guns go off, that the whole ship moves sideways. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it that's that's a little dip, that's just a little, a little correction. <laughs> um, Uh, I, I can't answer the question. We got to get you media trained. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do something with me. We got to give Uncle Bob some credit here. You know, he's such a wealth of, you're such a wealth of knowledge. And I've always respected you growing mm. up. You were always like the fun uncle mm. that you always gave me bits for attention and like would tickle me growing up. And you were always fun. I always had this respect for you mm. because of the way that you carried yourself. Mm. And, you know, I'd hear these stories if you'd go to the grocery store and then there would be a couple men showing up at your wife's doorstep. Oh, you know, Uncle Bob's got to go away and do some stuff like that. That was very interesting to hear growing up. I, I kind of knew that you 
did some work, but I didn't really understand the gravity of what it was, which mm. is what's so cool about your book. Mm. So the, you were sharing with me that the book is actually written for people in the military and officers to read today. But I see that I like I get entertained by this kind of stuff too. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm very happy that you enjoyed the book and enjoyed the ending. Uh, we had a lot of different. My wife and I had a lot of difficulty with the ending because it seems to be a little abrupt. But what can you do when you have a situation? I don't want to tell you the end of the story here. So, uh, when you have a, a dyna dynamic situation that happens, and then there's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's life. You know, when you have an attack like 9-11, the attack takes place, there's a buildup and everything, and then all of a sudden, the Twin Towers come down, and that's it. It's the end of the story. Well, it's like a, it's like a escalation, <laughs> and, and then... then Peak clouds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we see this with different novel events. It's like this amplification, this escalation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a collapse and then it unfolds and then it's like, oh, wow. But then there's something next. It's like the lens in media is always constantly shifting to something else. What do you think that does to the human psyche? Well, hopefully the, the, the purpose behind the book, hopefully wants to, uh, to do just that, to, to wake up certain um, aspects or certain people within our society to say, hey, this may be a threat. If this book had been written um, prior to 9-11, it might have um, woken some of the people up as to the potential threat that, it, that terrorism posed. The book isn't just about terrorism. It's, it's about, uh, about the heartache, uh, about an individual um, and, and the trials and tribulations that she goes through uh, and and basically tries to show uh, the reasons why she chose the direction that she chose um, and how um, that is realistic in today's society, particularly realistic for from her perspective as uh, she, she was at the top of her, her game, much like you are, and, and then uh, all of a sudden she loses everything. She loses a chance to be employed. She loses her country, her citizenship. She's shipped off back to Iran and how that affects her and the decision she makes following that. And um, uh, the, the, the fact that her parents were killed by the U.S. military uh, really didn't impact her at all in the beginning, but it started to as as her um, uh, as her story unfolds. As you unfold your shorts a little yeah. bit there, yeah. So it's the <laughs> it's the unfolding of our lives. So when you mentioned someone was at the top of their game, something happens. There, I mean, we all go through a hero's journey, mm -hmm. right? Every Jedi in Star Wars goes mm -hmm. through this. They have to work with a mentor, and then there's a challenge, then they overcome the challenge, then they receive the reward. And so that's obviously in every single type of book or movie that we watch. There's something that can happen, though, when people go through these shifts in their lives. I believe that when doors close they're meant to close. Mm -hmm. And then there's other doors that open. And I think it's the way that we frame things that can make all the difference and bring more peace in our lives. Like if something happens, okay, something happens, there can be some low vibration emotions with that fear, shame, guilt, but we can't stay there. We have to let that flow and then move forward. And this happens to all of us. But Talk to us about like the dynamic and the shifts of the main character in the story and what she did right and maybe some of the things she could have done better. Well, the, I think what she did right from, from her perspective was that she, she embraced the changes that were forced on her. There was no going back. There was no sense regretting all the stuff that had happened to her. She couldn't go backwards, so she had to go forward. And uh, she went forward to the extent, with the assistance of, of people around her, um, to become a, a, a very um, 
important member of Iranian society and in the, in the uh, uh, military industrial complex. Uh, she developed drones, of course, which, which I indicate in the book, were later exported to, to, um, uh, to other war areas. And, uh, and, and it turns out that they were, the Iranians are, were many, many years ahead of us in the development of drones for military purposes. Um, so I wrote that into the story to, to show that she moved forward. She moved forward from the catastrophe that was shit. And then what happened? She had another catastrophe. I mean, I couldn't leave it there. I mean, what kind of a story would it be if she, she goes to Iran, she becomes a high member of, of the Iranian society, uh, lives a happy life, and then, and then dies? I mean, what kind of story would that be? It's like we, don't, we, we can't expect to have peace all day, every day in our lives. There's going to be shifts. And I really believe that in real life, we're never going to be given too many challenges than we can handle especially if we're praying for something. Yes. God's not going to give us on a silver platter. Okay, here's exactly what you asked for. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to be tested first. You're going to have things taken away to make room for the other things and to really make sure that you deserve it and that you can handle and then you can hold all of these things that's in store for you. So the, the, the faith component's imp really important. And I know that that's important in what I do here on the show. Uh, faith is a key part of, of having peace and getting clarity and quietening the mind and, and prayer is, is really important. That's, that's very true for you and I. May not be so true for the whole of your audience. Uh, that that's, faith is something that, that an individual has to uh, embrace before they can, uh, they can move forward to another, another area. Uh, but you're but you're quite right. You have to have faith in in human mind. You have to have faith in 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 your neighbor and and so on in order to function properly in in a world such as such we have right now. If you were to offer me, you know, three pieces of tradecraft as a woman and for listeners that you think are really actually quite helpful for the civilian population to to do and know. What would those three things be? I, I would say watch your surroundings wherever you are. Uh, pay attention to, um, to things going on around you. Um, with my training, one of my things that, uh, that I was taught was always look for an area of escape. Um, always find something in in your surroundings that will allow you to escape from a developing situation that you're concerned about. Uh, so there's two. Um, I can't think of another one off the top of my head, but uh, you know, it, it's, you have to avoid the, the fight or flight fantasy because uh, that uh, invokes uh, emotions that you may not want, you know, if, particularly if somebody t troubles you and uh, you immediately get your guard up and, and, and you're prepared to, to fight. Um, uh, that may not be the appropriate answer in the given the circumstances. So Conflict resolution could be in the, the whole thing about the intelligence world is there's people like you and others that are really working diligently to avoid conflict. Well, um, I think you've misidentified what intelligence is. Uh, intelligence is the art of, of uh, interpreting or shift, shifting the data in order to provide the grown-ups or the elephants, as we used to call them, the, the people who run things, um, the best possible information as to what's going on mm -hmm. right now, not providing the solutions. The solutions come from them. You may suggest a solution or suggest a, a course of action, but it's really the grown-ups who, who make that decision. And intelligence is just the, the, the whole function of gathering information together, trying to make sense of it, and then providing those facts to, to the people who do make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, I, and I'm aware of the differentiation yeah. that there's 
the gathering information and then it's enacted. But what I mean by that is that's such an important part of our, of our society and how our, our countries run is that there's this shadow world of things and calamities that have been avoided that regular people will never hear about. That's right. And I, there was actually something, I don't know if you can talk about certain things, but even here locally that um, were avoided. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes people are, are better off not knowing what's exactly. going on. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I have so much respect for people that have done what you've done and the work that you've done. And, but I really see in you this component of the knowledge that you've acquired in your very important work that you've received awards from uh, multiple times. Share what some of those awards have been. Well, most of the most of the awards, um, other than one, I, I most of my other awards have been uh, just a, a reward for service. You know, the acknowledging people that uh, that have served in an area uh, for a period of time, and they get a mug or or something. Most of the awards are that. Um, but uh, I was surprised to receive the Lieutenant Governor's Award and the from the Province of Alberta for my time in working with in volunteer organizations because I didn't I didn't realize people were paying attention to that. Uh, I was doing it out of the goodness of my heart um, because I saw a need like with Scouts Canada, you, you want to impart the knowledge that you had uh, as a scouter to the younger generation so that they could enjoy mm -hmm. the, the outdoors and so on. Uh, and I was doing it just for that purpose. Um, so it was the parents that put your name forward because they saw the impact you had on their well, kids. Well, no, I don't know where that uh, where the suggestion came from. Well, uh, I have a feeling that's probably where it came from. Well, no, and I have been with Scouts Canada for many years. Mm -hmm. The Lieutenant Governor's Award came um, just last year or the year before. It was a very recent uh, award for my volunteer services in the province of Alberta. And as I said, I didn't even know people were paying attention to what I was doing. So, yes, you're very, you're I'm very, very appreciative of it, of course. Yeah, it's important to have that recognition. Um, I know with my personality type, I really, I really thrive on that when I get that uh, different professional accolades and awards and recognition. And I think it's, it's healthy to receive those awards and say, yeah, I did do a good job mm -hmm. and I was happy to do so. And it was of service mm -hmm. and I did it with integrity and it was recognized. So I think that's great. Uh, when it comes to your book for, so it's very much written for people to get an understanding of current events, um, but it's also very entertaining uh, the way that you've written it. There are some books that I'll just skim and then there's some other books that I'll literally hang off every word. Mm -hmm. And this book would make a fantastic movie. It would be a great movie. Absolutely. When would. I was writing it, I said, you know, if I were, were, were going to write a movie, uh, or write a book that would be turned into a movie, how would you do it? And when I started off, I said, well, I want to cover a very wide time period. So why don't we break the book into three major sections and then it could be a mini series. At mm -hmm. least that was my thought. And, uh, and that's what I did. The book is almost exactly divided into three parts. Uh, where we have Esther, um, who, who was did. there a significance to choosing that name, Esther? Um, I, I did it mainly because I could change um, her from from an English language um, version of her name to an Iranian version of her name rather easily. So it goes Esther to Esther. Mm -hmm. it, it uh, that was the reason why that name was chosen um, but um, uh, the the whole first third of the book covers 2013 and it it describes um, her situation where she finds out who she really is she gets expelled from the United States and all the terrible things that happened to her and she ends up in Iran that all takes place in 2013. And then the second section of the book uh, is, is sort of the middle part. It explains how she uh, pulled herself up and, and uh, 
gathered and, and is we, this was this the inspiration for a, a phoenix <laughs> well it's not a phoenix it's a shabazz, shabazz yes <laughs> but when typically people see this unless they know the meaning of yeah. shabazz which you explain in the book yeah. they would see this as a, a phoenix rising phoenix. and that's basically what happens to esther and 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 by extension the 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 whole state of Iran. They start off um, uh, absolutely crushed, and then they rise to the situation. Now, in in Iran's case, that's not something we want, but it is something that that happens to Esther, where she rises up. And then the third uh, portion of the book, the first two portions of the book um, are largely based on fact. Um, in the sense that they take place in the past. And um, other than the characters that I have created and, and put into the book, everything else is historically accurate. The, the invasion of, of uh, or the difficulties in Turkey, the, the difficulties with, with some of the ethnic groups and so on that, um, uh, that are involved, those are all real. They've been created at the end of the First World War and the whole division of the Middle East was all done um, after the First World War and is the cause of ethnic violence right to this present day. Um, they really did not think that situation through when they were dismantling the Ottoman Empire. Now, uh, having said that, the third section of the book takes place in 2025 and, and therefore, Everything in the future, that last section of the book, is all in the future. And um, it, it could be a precursor to another 9-11 type of situation. Mm. And that's Because this tension is really building right now, which is why yeah. the you know you really feel an urgency to get this book into as many hands as possible. Well, I would like to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the, uh, the, the sales have been down a little bit, but that's mainly because of, of advertising and not being able to get the book out to the public. Um, I think it's a great book. Most of the reviews I have had. Have I think it's a fantastic excellent. book. And, and you, we'll have the yeah, um, give me a review, yeah. how to <laughs> how to get the book in the description of this episode as well, everybody. And then stay tuned for the Audible. Excited for that. Yeah. I mean, it's like you gave birth to something. I mean, you've written things before, but this is this is uh, on a whole different level. This yeah. appeals to people in leadership positions. This appeals to myself for an entertainment, and also like I like to be entertained, but also learn things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Which is why uh, reading espionage is one of my favorite books mm -hmm. to read. Because again, it's also like this other life I could never lead. It would just be too stressful to have, you know, this knowledge of all these things that are happening. Like, how do you compartmentalize? I don't know how you did that um, in your career. I'm curious if when you were um, in intelligence, which I'm just this pretty, pretty brazen question, which country, because you presented at the UN, which country presented as having themselves together in the intelligence world, like very well run. And what do you think that was related to? Well, I think within the intelligence world, the United States is probably the, the best put together uh, nation, but not without errors. I mean, they made errors in the Persian Gulf, and they made errors uh, other places, but um, but as far as the intelligence community is concerned, they were probably the best put together, followed by the Brits. Um, uh, the rest of the European nations generally took the information that was provided uh, by uh, the Oz Canucas uh, forum and, um, and provided that information and, and built on that information for their own purposes. That didn't mean that they weren't important because they provided information to us that we didn't see. Mm -hmm. That's uh, why collaboration and yes. allies are so important. Mm -hmm. Resolving conflict, having mutually beneficial agreements. Like we need this in our lives, mm -hmm. even in our personal and professional relationships. That's why over time I'll kind of, you're going to think about these questions after this interview, and I'm sure we'll do a follow-up because what you have and the knowledge that you have, that's just on autopilot. Like you don't even think about this stuff, but it's so valuable mm -hmm. for people like me 
to give a balanced perspective and how to analyze the information that's coming at us from various angles and how to discern what is factual versus what is not factual, yeah. which I think a lot of people probably grapple with these days. Mm-hmm. You know, which diet's the best diet, which skincare is the best products to use. <laughs> so the, one of the whole premises of the show is to teach people how to be a more conscious consumer. Right. And I think that that also relates to our minds with our, our mental capacity and how we carry ourselves to not get overwhelmed and distracted by the bright, shiny objects, whether that be new products, new innovations, or what's on the news. Mm -hmm. What tips can you give people to have a more balanced perspective, especially during these like very novel amplified times? Um, Again, we we go back to the question of faith. Um, We need to to have something beyond ourselves that we can rely on. And, uh, and without that, and I, I've never been without it. So I, I really can't, um, really can't say, um, but I would imagine there, there's a great sense of hopelessness out there Mm -hmm. for people who don't have, um, faith. Uh, The, the, um, uh, the Muslims have a, have a, uh, an advantage over us uh, because they sincerely believe that, uh, that um, whatever happens, they're going to be, you know, in, in, in paradise with a thousand virgins or whatever it is that the situation uh, is for their martyrdom. Um, And they don't, they don't have any concern um, about their, their lives in the present because they, they're looking forward to the future. And the present is called the present for a reason. It's a gift. Yeah. But, um, um, but those in the Western world, uh, even those that are, that are deeply religious and have great faith, uh, still have that inkling of fear in the back of their head saying, you know, and I don't have that, uh, that if they don't have that personal relationship with, with, uh, with their creator, that they don't know what's going to happen at, that point in time when they're no longer living. Mm -hmm. And this is life in general. Like we're all Mm -hmm. just figuring things out. Like there's not very mass, many masters of life on the planet at this point. We're all just putting it together, analyzing the information, what information feels the best for us. What can we apply? What can we discard and really finding people that we, we trust and we, and we resonate with and notice when, okay, that information, it just doesn't feel right for me. And I'm sure you discern this in your intelligence career too. It's like, uh, that doesn't really fit in this puzzle. I'm going to kind of keep it over here, but I'm going to kind of look for other information because I kind of feel like it's going over here. I mean, that's, that's quite a skill set. And, um, one of the things that I've learned about myself is to trust myself, mm-hmm. When I started doing Zoom calls for one-on-one consultations in 2017, people didn't know what I was doing, talking to people in, in a room from the other side of the world. And you know, e-commerce, selling products online, started to do that well before the pandemic as well. And that's really when things boomed. And looking to the future for longevity and anti-aging, it really comes down to having a grounded perspective and being at peace and being balanced and not becoming too extreme. So tying back to world events and you know politics and things like that. What's one tip that you would give when it comes to say having a family dinner or a gathering in general and politics comes up? How do we navigate and negotiate that while still you know, I'm, I'm big on etiquette. And one of the things about etiquette is to allow people to feel comfortable and not to say or do things that's going to make someone else uncomfortable. And I go into a lot of these topics and much deeper in my membership. How do you respond to my sentiment of not bringing those things up at the, the dinner table? I mean, it's not about sticking your head in the sand and not being aware and formulating your own opinions with what feels right for you. But how do we navigate that and keeping our family unit together? Because I think that this division stuff at the end of the day, 
it's a distraction from our live from us living our best lives and you know leave it to the intelligence crew community to put it all together we really know nothing here so how do we in real life navigate those tough conversations when they come up we realize that there aren't shared values there's different perspectives there's a lack of empathy maybe on one or both parties how do we put up boundaries to skirt around topics, not talk about them or how to talk about them in like a very um, well-formed etiquette way. You can, you can uh, generally get the feel of the room very quickly. Uh, if you, you mentioned that, uh, that you're a supporter of Bush or supporter of Biden or, or whatever, you can get a, a real feel, even though we're not even involved in the election. Um, the best, uh, the best, avenue to take is to avoid politics altogether it's i've always been of the i of agree the, with you of well. the opinion that um you can't argue with a closed mind mm -hmm. if people have made up their minds as to what they believe you know they they think uh pierre elliott trudeau walks on water there's nothing you can say or do that is going to change their mind on that. Because of confirmation of the bias, evidence. they're going to keep looking for information that supports their yeah, sentiment right. already. Yeah. And and uh, and all they need to do is go to CBC to find that out, um, to find their support. And and the same applies with U.S. politics and so on. So once people have made up their minds, I mean, it, it's not a liberal versus conservative. They they have entrenched their values in. Um, a specific area. They, they don't like Trump because he's a felon. Okay, well then no matter what anybody else says, he's still a felon. And therefore, they wouldn't vote for him if he was the last person on earth. Uh, and and uh, the same in Canada with, with Canadian politicians. The, the best uh, advice that I would have in situations like that is you just don't talk about politics at all. I agree. You can't argue with a closed mind. You're not going to change their situation. So all you're going to do is disrupt whatever balance exists in the, the various relationships. I'm glad that you mentioned that because when I'm in conversation with someone or in a group setting or in a family setting, I want to hear about what's happening in the lives of those who I'm around. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about other people or other situations that really do we have a proper balanced assessment mm -hmm. intelligence on the situation? No, we're showed what the algorithm and the news wants us to mm -hmm. see. Um, so I, I personally don't think it's worthwhile having those conversations at the same token though, if we're in a relationship or we're looking to form personal and professional connections, you still have to have those shared values, but there's this kind of skirting around that I do think is important. So what I do is if I kind of notice and pick up on different things that someone doesn't have shared values, I shift the framework of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's part of negotiation as well. Chris Voss talks about this a lot. So it doesn't go, you know, too off track and you kind of rein it in. And I know we were, uh, we're here in my place and we were having a pretty heated conversation about politics yesterday. And it wasn't that heated. Well, As I say, you can't argue with a closed mind. <laughs> but but I was kind of in the living room and you were all kind of here at the table and it was just getting really loud. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is my home, my rules. It was very loud for me to hear. I tried to say something about four times and I, I don't raise my voice. That's not my style. And I couldn't speak. It's like, this, I don't like where this is going. I can sense that there's some not shared values from mm -hmm. the political perspective. This isn't a constructive conversation. How much information do we really have? Are we really right? And so I actually rang my Tibetan bowl. Mm -hmm. But when I, I rang, when I rang that, it actually, I meant to just kind of tap it, but it actually rang really loud. And then after that, my sister came up and, and said to me, you know, we do have to have these conversations mm -hmm. with family. And then my mom said, I'm really happy you did that. <laughs> but as soon as I did that, it was just like the shift with energy. I'm just trying to give people strategies of how to shift that dynamic. So obviously you're not going to have a Tibetan bowl um, at every situation when this happens, but how can you graciously shift a conversation? Because otherwise there's going to be people that don't want to be part of it. They're just going to be quiet and they're not going to enjoy themselves. 
So we ha almost have this like role, I guess, who's hosting the event to notice the dynamics. And for me, it was in my home. So that's the choice that I had. You know, I'm not saying it's a good choice or a bad choice, but it solved the problem mm -hmm. and got us to shift the energy and to talk about something else. Uh, what other kind of tips, like what, what have you thought about with me sharing that? Um, other than reinforcing the, the fact that um, uh, you have to change the topic, you know, once, once you realize with, that you're dealing with people who, who have already made their decision, um, it's time to talk about something else mm -hmm. you know, and shift it to, to cars and uh, your most recent accident, you know, those kinds of things. <laughs> it's interesting you went there because you were actually just in a car crash. Yes. So that makes sense. I'm glad that you are here and you made it, you made it. Well, I'm a little upset about the guy that came down the, the on-ramp and came right over into my lane, hit me. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, no, the, the vehicle is repairable and, and there were nobody injured. So mm -hmm. yeah, we move on to the next day. Exactly. We, there were, there's a conflict, there's a situation exactly. You, you use a perfect word. We flow into the next thing. We don't perseverate. We, you know, obviously have to process things mentally and being in two car crashes myself too. Mm -hmm. Um, and having the physical stuff with that, it's, it's, you kind of get reminded of it, but you just have to stay positive and read books like Shabazz rising yes, that you you're going to learn something from, um, get an insight into key things that are happening at this time and learn some trade craft and some things that from, I think just general living perspective are just kind of interesting to know that people live these lives and they do these things. And uh, yeah, I'm very appreciative for you taking the time to be here. Robert sure. Rogers, my uncle Bob, do you have any closing words for just, us? Just that uh, people are looking for the book. Um, uh, the book is available on Amazon, both Canada and the U S uh, it's, it's available in an E uh, version um, through Google, Google books and Apple books and, uh, and so on. Um, if they're looking for my website, my website is Shabab rising dot C A. Uh, and that's spelled S H A H B A Z rising dot C A. And that'll be in the show notes as well. Yeah. And then also on social media, a uh, Robert Rogers official, uh, is also where you can stay up to date with my uncle Bob here and some of the things that he's going to be putting out because he really is a leader um, in various levels and just has so much goodness to share with the world to stay up to date with things, but also stay balanced and also stay grounded. But what some of the strategies are that we can utilize to get the most out of this life and and enjoy our families and live a life of purpose, which is what you've done with writing this book. You're living your purpose. Well, thank you, Rachel. My I, pleasure. I didn't think we were going to be here at this point in time when I was changing your diapers. <laughs> <laughs> and giving me lots of tickles. Yeah, you always have given me so much love and I have just very happy memories of us and our family time together. And I'm just really proud of you for number one, writing a book in my favorite genre as well. And, um, you know, I just really respect you. And the older I've gotten, the more mature I've gotten, the more I really appreciate just the depth and the value of what you've done to serve our country and to keep us safe and to hopefully avoid different things behind the scenes. I have a lot of re uh, respect for our military personnel and what they give up in their lives in order to be of service and, and protect us as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us here on the School of Radiance podcast. This was a very fun and exciting interview for me to do and share just an incredible book, kind of get it behind the scenes of some of the books that I like to read uh, from an entertainment and also a learning perspective and learn more over at the school of radiance.com and in the membership. Yes, I do include a couple of different tactics that I think are really important for our everyday lives to show up and be our best versions and make intelligent decisions, communicate effectively and resolve conflicts while doing it all with grace and ease and moving through conflicts and finding conflict resolution 
in a, in an easier way with a little bit more flow so that you don't age faster so that your adrenals don't get overloaded and that your skin doesn't break out and all your hair doesn't fall out and you put on weight and you have better relationships. So this stuff is all tied into, in my opinion, and it's really worked for me. So if it's helped me, this kind of information, I'm sure it's going to help you too. And really, this is actually the information that I really look for. Uh, so I'm really happy to have been able to share this. So thank you very much. Thank you.